Hey, so hi everyone, today I have a slightly different video. We have an interview with Zazibu. Zazibu is one of the best players on TTS. He has finished top, top 10 in Season 2 and Season 3. Um, he is also one of the best Armani Cast players with the highest win rate in Season 1. So in this interview, I talked to him about a bunch of various stuff, but mainly about how to play Armani Cast. So take this as a leader's guide on like how to play Armani Cast. I hope you enjoyed this video. And yeah, Thanks for having me. Thanks, Chiz. Uh, so yeah, my real name is Andrea, I'm from Serbia, and I started playing uh, the Dune probably just before the X came out. So I played a little bit of just the base game. But mostly I have been playing through the entire X and then now in Immortality as well. So yeah, and that entire time I've been playing uh, Archduke the most. <laughs> so <laughs> so in this time like do you have like a group of like real life friends who you're playing with and are they on tts now or did you like transition over by yourself yeah so i started playing with a couple of friends we started playing in the local uh game like uh, pub uh they just bought the dune and we played it first time with completely false rules it was not good at all but then we redid it and we liked it a lot and then slowly but surely our group grew and then we had our own like dune section in the club where we would organize like a little tournaments and stuff like that at some point we, we even had a league but yes uh the the ones that are like most notables that uh tra trans transferred with me on the tts as well are Matia and I don't know how many people know him but his name is Drogiran of Pile. He has a biker on his like icon. Oh yeah yeah I know both of them. <laughs> so all of you are from the same like pub like pub or like gaming Yeah. Shop? We are all from the same like part of the city. Wow. Yes. Do you all do you all share ideas a lot or do you all like talk about the game a lot? Uh yeah, with Mattia, like the I I speak with him about the game a lot. Uh, I know him personally as well, like even before the pub. So yeah, we we I mean whenever expansion comes out or uh, your videos comes out, <laughs> we like to make like new strategies and stuff. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, later, you can share me like <laughs> some of the the reflections you'll have from my videos. I think they'll be interesting. Okay, but but um, can maybe we we'll talk about Dune first? Like, what what is it about Dune that is so captivating? So what I like about the Dune is it has like I like interactive games a lot. I don't like the games where it's just like uh, how do you say it? points cocaine we call it basically. So basically, we're just competing who is going to get most points. There's no interaction between the players. It's just how, like, uh, well, I can combine the stuff I have. I like the Dune because, of course, it has that aspect because we have to measure, like, who is going to win or determine who is going to win. But uh, there's, uh, like, Dune is all about interaction between the players. Like, diplomacy-wise, combat-wise, uh, and also because it's... if it is it is a worker placement game so I can block you or prevent you from going to certain spaces if I go there first. That is the thing I like the most about the Dune and before this game I played uh, Twilight Imperium. I don't know if you know the game and many people know it but <laughs> it's probably my favorite tabletop game but that one thing why I prefer Dune over Twilight is because Twilight takes a stupid l amount of time to play, and Dune takes like 40 minutes if <laughs> if we are on clocks and people are like good at it, you know. So, and for me, in a sense, Dune is like a simplified, faster, and more competitive version of Twilight, you know. And I also like the deck building portion as well. Deck building, kind of, Dune did it very well, I think. Uh, compared to other games like Terraforming Mars and stuff. So, yeah, that's the main reason why I like it in comparison to other board games. 
Oh, okay. I I, I played to- a bit of Twilight Imperium too. Uh, the issue is that I, I can never get enough people to sit down for the amount of time. And <laughs> that's why I ended up selling my copy. But I did play it actually for my bachelor party. <laughs> I got a bunch of my friends and we just spent the whole day playing Twilight Imperium. It, it's, a, it's, yeah. it's a great game. Um, we, when, we, when we first bought it, I had five of my friends lend me the money. <laughs> wanted to play it as well <laughs> and then we played it for one month basically every three or four days it was like a summer break or something in the high school and then uh, yeah i think they all life. yeah so let's um let's take a step back and uh, just talk about yourself um what are you doing now like you know, what's your background yeah so uh, at the moment, I'm at university. I'm third third year. Uh, I'm studying computer science. science. Uh, we have um, the university in my country lasts for four years, so it basically means I have one more year left. And the, I'm now just entering, or rather, starting my final year. Uh, uh, after that, I just plan on start working. I don't know. So basically, I'm. Last year of my studies, I hope I will finish this year <laughs> if something doesn't go terribly wrong. And then, yeah, basically, I'm going to be looking for a job. Okay, that's great. That's great. So, Zazibu, what is your favorite leader? Can you tell everybody? Okay, so if Lannister is recognizable for Prince Rombur Vernius, I'm. Okay, I'm not as recognizable as him, but my favorite favorite re- leader by far is Arpyuk Armandekaz. Like, by far. Because he, he requires a lot of skill to play, but he's also, like, not very rewarding, which is not a good combination, you know, for anything. For something to have a high skill demand and then not as great of, like, uh, result output as, as you would expect. But the thing is, Archduke, in my opinion, can shine in a game. I don't think like anybody can compare like to his like deck building skills. Because if you just get going and make the deck you want, I think that's the best feeling I had in playing this game. Like you play influence leaders, for example, Tessia, you can win with only like your regular set of cards and maybe uh, like. Uh, I don't know, one card that uh, gives you something small. Because she, by default, as a leader, is very strong. Archduke, by default, is not very strong. But if you can be quick and get some good cards and focus on your trashing, you're going to get such a good deck. And it feels so amazing. Make all the different combinations you can with the cards that uh, Dune, Dune provides. So, so some background for Armani uh, Cash. I think Armani uh, Cash uh, averages at around a 22 to 24% win rate, which is actually relatively respectable relative to the other leaders. Um, it fits in a, in a band that is slightly below the, the, the top five leaders. Uh, and, but I think he is considered playable. I think a lot of players uh, gravitate towards him because he is fun. I think there are, there are some elements of his gameplay that are fun. And people who like play a lot of deck builders would gravitate towards him. I think people who play a lot of deck builders like Dominion and... Or like people who play a lot of Dominion and when they come into uh, into Dune Imperium and they see, see a leader that has ability to trash, their mind immediately starts firing and like going going a bit crazy and they and they try to, yeah. they try to play him very well. You try to play this leader. <laughs> so... So I can tell what? my I can tell my issues with this leader. So 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 when Immortality first came out, I thought that Amani Kes was was sitting very well into the meta. The reasoning because of that was the game was a lot slower, right? So if the game was a lot slower. Then when you have more time, your 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 deck building kind of um, gets a lot better. The issue after. The initial, um, I guess, an initial few months, maybe the initial three months. I think as the game got a lot faster, people started to end a lot earlier, and I think also people started to figure out that Swordmaster was very important. And and uh, when you play Amani Cas, you you want Swordmaster, but they they aren't great. You don't have an innate ability to to get it quickly. So 
Can, can you run through me, for me your thought process about what are you supposed to do with Armani Cast now and like w- how does he shine? So first, I'd like to compare him to the other leaders that you can pick from. In regards to the deck building leaders, you, you, you can have like Paul, Helena, or Ilvan basically. Those are with Armand based, I think. Okay, maybe Ariana as well to some extent. But those four or five leaders are the ones that are mainly oriented about uh, building their decks to be as strong as powerful. Where Paul and Count focus on having bigger decks, but focus on draw. So, for example, if you have that like three, four very good cards in your deck, you're constantly hoping and trying to find them in your bigger deck. Helena, on the other side, doesn't have that good of a draw, but Helena can find her draw on the map because he, she cannot be blocked on blue spaces. And she also has the biggest pri- priority on the good cards in the Imperium Bro because of her ring. But still, she ends up with what I constantly see, big deck, and then she just gets stuck with all the good cards being somewhere and being unable to find them. Here is why I like Ekas. So he doesn't focus on big deck. When I play Ekas, I always, always, always try to balance uh, my deck to be about ideally eight cards, but if not nine cards, nine cards. Basically, nine cards is when you because the Sikela is tra- trashes by default, so you have nine cards in your starter deck. Every round, if you trash and buy one card, for example, you should be at a, at a nine cards. But if you find any other ways of trashing, or maybe you don't buy something some rounds, then you 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 will be able to come to the eight. Uh, why is eight very nice? Eight is a, eight is a sweet spot for manipulating your deck. Uh, for example, people will always. I mean, I talked about Matia with this, but people prefer, and he even prefers, Paul over uh, Archduke. But my problem with Paul is that, okay, if you have a bigger deck, her, his passive ability prescience can be very good. Like, like that momentum where you're, you're deciding whether or not you want to draw that next card or not is beneficial, sure. But when you have eight card deck and you have five out of eight cards in your hand and like half of those cards are good, probably even draw you cards, uh, it's not very like there's not a, that big of a difference what is my next card going to be or even if I don't drew it this round somehow, I'm guaranteed to get it next round. So and also with eight and with uh, deciding whether or not you want some cards shuffled or not, it's very easy to do that. Because uh, when you have a big deck, you cannot easily, especially with the whole graft mechanics, force two cards to be shuffled and then drawn in the same hand. Where if you have eight, that's much much more like plausible. Uh, that's, a, that's like my main thing in with him in comparison to all the other leaders. And I also think that's like the main reason, as you already mentioned, why people prefer him because of the fun element of combining strong cards, etc. The problem, biggest problem, is how to balance influence with like especially those early rounds where you don't have the, as you said, Swordmaster, how to balance influence with uh, constantly using your passive mechanic and trashing cards. Like, learn how to do that, then Ikaz very much becomes, like, a, in my opinion, the top tier leader. Because you the, that is the, the one thing that is really holding him back. Utilizing uh, coordination to its maximum and still be able to be relevant and scoring your at least four... Uh, for uncontest, uncontested influence points. So you say a lot of things, but I, so, so let's say if I want to play Amani Cass, what I'm still stuck with is that I want to do a lot of things, but I don't really know what to do, right? So so I want to trash cards. I want to buy good cards, right? I, I do want to get, I think I do want to get Swordmaster, but I do not know like how do I 
prior, what do I prioritize and how do I get to get, okay, okay, get okay. to that point, right? How do I get to a point when like I feel like I'm starting to snowball? Okay, so first things first. As there is a, we need to realize one thing at the beginning is just that if for example, if I play Dune and I can be guaranteed to have Ikaz every game, uh, not every game is going to be like a good Ikaz game. There's some times where if you pick Ikaz, when you see the cards that are already in Imperium row, for example, in the Shadow or the Deluxe Surgeon or etc., that you can like utilize with your ring. Of course, those games will be like, those are like no-brainer games where you should immediately pick Herman Ikaz. Because either you will pour, force your opponents to burn their Atomics or you'll just grab one of the two like most broken cards in the game. That's the first thing. Second thing is you always prioritize having low number of cards because what I've learned in my three years of playing this game, two and a half, I don't know, is even the like weakest cards, if played stupid amount of times, I mean, if you have, it can be like, it can have like a drastic uh, difference or make a great impact on the game. For example, in my recent uh, turning turning games, like uh, Fra- Frighter Fleet from the from the X expansion, that card gives you only one uh, bump on shipping. But if you can make, if you can play it every turn, if you can guarantee to have played it every turn, it will give you five bumps on shipping. You know, it doesn't seem a lot at the moment when I say it, but in the game, it, it basically, if you do that, if you make three bumps on the shipping or two bumps in the shipping in Frighter Fleet, that's already, you're halfway there to the Swordmaster, even even more, because that's already five, five points. So in my head, you always prioritize having low number of cards in the deck, because that is the one thing you can abuse the most. You can abuse having in some cases, weaker effects, in some cases, stupidly powerful effects, repeating every turn or maybe every turn, every third turn not repeating. So two in a time and then one skip. That is where Ikaz shines. Now, what I do to make my deck be as small as possible while still be able to do everything you want on the board. Like this is this vary, varies from game to game, but basically the early game with Ekas in the first round you have already laid out steps what you want to do. I'm speaking where you pick Ekas most likely on the fourth or third position. If you pick it, you can pick it on the second position. It's also okay, but I almost never pick it at the first position. Feels like in those early stages, like if you play fourth or even third, I think third is the better, you have kind of prior on the first two game conflicts, you know? And then if you have, because you're playing last or second to last, and if you're playing second or second to last, you can really easily uh, pick second or third position in the conflicts, and then you can get those two or three Solari, which when combined with Conspire or Wealth, are going to probably be the cause of your sword master, that, or the way that you're going to obtain your sword master. If you're playing first, it's very hard to pick the conflicts, and it's also you're not going to be getting uh, smuggling, let alone interstellar shipping. So you are going to be struggling for sword master the most, I think, as first. Second, I think is good if first goes for full space. So it's a gamble, you know? So third or fourth, third, I think most preferably for me, because if you're third, you're also playing first on the conflict, first uh, stage three conflict. That is basically the biggest, uh, I think, advantage. Me and Mati also discussed this. That is the biggest advantage, I think, of third position that not many people are realizing. Like, just being able to, like, knowingly, you're going to be first to play on the when the stage three comes out and uh, like you you have priority on high line where you have priority on any place you need for it to make like uh like a certain win for you if you can manage it 
So yeah, that is one thing to think about. Yes. So first round, what I want, what I want you to do, but you always go wealth mental round one. You don't even, you don't, you just don't think about it. You go wealth over here, you go mental. That is what you do with Ekas round one, because it allows you, it gives you your push on the emperor that you need. Because when are you going to go emperor ever in your life? If not at the beginning, it gives you extra card, which is okay, doesn't really matter. But it, what it does, it allows you to play another card and it, it allows you to play another card and gives you ability to trash. The only, the only reason why would you not do it or when you don't do it is when you draw in your first hand both of your access cards or neither of your access cards. If you draw if you draw both both of the access cards, you just play both. It's okay if you don't trash because like I like to think about Sick Allies is, is like my trashing for that turn. You, you you just play both. You even if even if you need to go secrets or something like that, you play both. If you draw either ideal combination is you just draw one and then you and wealth was not occupied and it shouldn't be occupied. If you don't have Ilban before you, and that is one other thing I wanted to talk about. When you're picking leaders, if you see that uh, remaining leaders that you have uh, to choose from are one of the, those leaders are Ekaz and Ilban, you have to think about if I pick Ekaz, will Ilban be sitting right in front of me? Because like Ilban really hard counters uh, Yuna and Ekaz. Same, the same goes for Ekaz and Yuna, like because all of them want really hard to go on wealth, especially in the first few rounds. So the one with the one that's going first will have priority for that space, and also the Mentat, which Ekaz and Ilban, and to extend Taleto also want to go badly early game, and then you have to think about to keep that in mind uh, because. If you let somebody in front of you pick Ilban, you're gonna be blocked constantly. That that's what I want to say. So moving on. So 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 if you if you have both factions, you play both of them, and not you you wealth mentor and try to yeah. to get involved in combat. Like yeah, you try to, you try you try to get like if there's coin in the com combat, and there is I think a fairly like. Uh, like decent chance it is going to be in first two, rather in first stage than in second. But yes, then you try to get least third place because it's very easy when you're the last. You you know exactly like almost certainly which amount of troops will get you the desired place you want. Yes, and if you can like basically make yourself be on the like a get four spice. Or something like that, because nobody focuses spies that much in the first two rounds. Everybody is focused on shipping, influence, whatever. You can you can then turn two or three, just hit conspire, and then like it is also the thing in immortality is so easy for some leaders to start shipping. So basically, in my average game, I think I think at least one person is going to. Sh already making shipping around two or three like i don't know like, when, what when was the last time i got per, uh, people shipping only like first time on uh, on round four so even with that like uh, extra coins that you will be getting from shipping they're gonna be pumping you slowly to the because when you go on spire wealth that's only one extra coin that you need to get for like uh, only one person needs to do the full shipping this rotation to give you the that one extra coin for Swordmaster. So it's my, in my opinion, it's not that um, it's not that hard to secure that. The problem is what I have learned from many games is that Ikaz is going to like on average peak in round eight or nine. Helena as well, but you that is the reason you want to like trim down your deck as fast as you can because you want to be, you want to push that peak down to round 7 because round 7 is where i think 90% of the games are ending like immediately turn conflict 3 comes along 
it resolves. So yes, that is the that is the like main thing. Also, if you see, as I said, any of these two cards in the Imperium row, I wouldn't give a second thought about who I'm gonna play. This card is so good with Ekas. I cannot stress enough how good she is. Like, just ju I mean, it's just the smallest thing, but like. I don't think I can count how many times, like in casual play or ranked play or whatever, I just keep her until the last round. I'm sitting over here somewhere, it doesn't really matter, around Bene Gesserit, even on two, and somebody is sitting, for example, has the alliance, or the, doesn't even have the alliance, and then you just, for example, hit Seekers or take some other, other way extra bump, and then she gives you two bumps on Bene Gesserit last round because you reveal her and you trash her. And people just don't seem to expect that. Like they forget you can do that. And you just steal that alliance super quick. And that just gives you that extra swing, like in the end, that I don't know how many times I've done it. I think like any game I have it, I'm trying to do that. And it's very easy to accomplish because it's it's very like uh, you're guaranteed to draw to draw her almost every round. I, I think every time I see in the shadows being revealed and bought by someone, I already give up on the Penetrator Alliance. That's how powerful I think this this card is. One of the things I hate the most in Dune Imperium is that when when I, especially when I'm playing like seriously, is that when I buy something and it flips over for the next person, it's just such a miserable feeling. <laughs> <laughs> also, the fact, the fact that she was two. And that they're guaranteed to have enough to buy it. All yeah. of seven. Yeah. <laughs> okay. But I also want to just, just, just like a quick side note. I wanted to ask, what is, in your opinion, the best card? Like, not the strongest effect. Like, you, for example, uh, uh, Wizards, which is probably like one of the stronger effects. But for its price, it's not that good. What is, in your opinion, the be your favorite or the best card in the game? Oh, my favorite and best card, I think, are quite different. I think, actually, actually Tardexu Surgeon is probably the best card in, in the game. Um, mm -hmm. Unless unless you can luck into Tardexu Master, like, round one without working for it. Yeah. So, so if you can luck, like, like, there are a lot of times where you can just luck into Tardexu Master, like... It just happens so often. Like people don't work for it. So 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 there there are two there are two elements of it. One time Twilight Kingdom Masters on the roll, people are racing for it, right? And if when people are racing for it, people will early reveal for it. People will do strange things to get it. So they sacrifice a bunch of things. But there are yeah, some yeah. some hands where person gets convincing, convincing. Some other one persuasion card plays uh, plays some random uh, seek allies and goes yeah one other card and has five persuasion then somehow then they decide to nuke the rule cause the rule is not good and then they luck into a to Tarixo master round one and i feel that is that is probably the most game ending feeling i have when someone lucks into it or when someone like just stumbles into it when someone has worked for it i don't feel so bad about it um but other than that uh Prob like a round two pick up a surgeon or um yeah surgeon in the shadow I think are uh, probably things that I hate the most like sur sur surgeon is I hate the most <laughs> yeah sur surgeon is is disgusting I I is is two points like like people think like you know your first point is free but no your first point is not free your first point requires you to play some amounts of experimentation surgeon frees you up from that from that requirement at totally and it gives you two spies while you're at it and two intrigues you know it's it's no the, the so card the card is, the fact that it also reveals for two and that it has such a good uh, access because it goes on purple and it has emperor access for some reason as well i don't know why yes <laughs> it goes faction as well you know you it's yeah. like it you, does you, everything. It pays your bills. It uh, takes care of your children. You know? It's a very good card. It's, yeah, I agree. This is the like the best card by far in the game at the moment. Like because if you play it twice, what we've discussed it. If you play it twice, you go two times on the emperor over here with it. Yeah, you're basically guaranteed point at least one on emperor. You're done with emperor track. You can. Mm. 
right for go for alliance doesn't matter and it also basically finishes the entire row over here yeah because you can get three just by going over here yes yeah it's uh yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy good, crazy good. It's, it's painful to play against <laughs> But, but yeah, I agree. In my in my opinion, also the Telexo Master has just lost tremendous value over the course of the expansion. Like I remember at the start, people were like, uh, there were like threads on the Discord debating: Do we need to like redo this card? Do we need to ban it entirely from the game? Yada yada yada. But like, what people don't realize, and what I like actually about the Telexo Master, and I think it's the weakness of it as well is the thing that uh i mean you can even watch i think you you made a i think a very good comment i think it was in my last like tourney game as well like um i don't remember the set like the specific player that bought it but it was like round four or five and he like had a choice between telexo master and other like good card maybe remember. a power play yeah he picked a power yes, play yeah. yeah and he took i think even maybe it was the treacher even and he took telexo master and people don't even realize, like, uh, like fourth round by itself is already kind of late. Yeah. Or fifth. Like you're drawing him maximum once if yeah. you're not if you're lucky twice until yeah. the end. And then they don't even look at the uh, Telaxu board where they are currently. So they pick him even if they're like I don't know over here somewhere in the middle, and they don't realize it's they're not it's not going to do anything for them basically. And uh, also, like a small advice with any leader that you're playing, or in general, I should say, like in my recent games, I have tried. I don't know if people realized it. I think you realized it a little bit <laughs> because you made a comment uh, on one of the games you posted with playing with me in, in Mati. I think uh, I always prioritize playing playing Dune. Like I always prioritize playing Dune. The experimentations. I, yeah, yeah, experimentations. Yes. Like, yeah. I very, very much like this trash over here and the uh, specimen. And of, obviously, I like this part over here with the bug and the bump. I basically always go the, like, downhill path. I never go up. But uh, it's just that so many things, there's so... Yeah, those as well, I want to say. So there's, like, two new end games that give you points for that. There's such such an such a value in shipping because you're getting bugs, you're getting specimens. Those bring you points as well, in one way. And then people just neglect it. And if you prioritize dunes, uh, you're also like uh, there's not a lot of yellow places on the board. And if you like prioritize dunes, you're also kind of blocking other play people from playing it. If it makes sense. So even in turns where they would or wished or needed to play it they are now not able to play it so you're kind of like getting like pressuring them to think about it and then whenever in dune you can make a opponent do you do something on a turn uh, in which they didn't plan to do it so they now must do it is very good because as you said they need to sacrifice now something for it and it gives you just so much more pressure on the board and you just start, start like uh, focusing on some other things they're letting them take your alliance and stuff like that okay so so before we proceed i think when when Zazibu says dune he's referring to experimentations um, yeah yeah sorry, sorry. yeah just just stick to me with like uh because <laughs> former name was dune yeah uh but so, okay so 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 my counterpoint to this is that uh without swordmaster and do you feel still feel that experimentations are prioritized so highly to be played uh okay depend without swordmaster depends on what kind of like uh what is your point in your gameplay like uh, what are you doing in your gameplay I'm just saying in general, my style is has always been focused around like uh, uh, so mostly about what I'm speaking is referring to that style of play. So I have always been focused about conflicts and 
uh, influence. So I've, I have never been focused that much on like buying spices must flow and grinding. I, I, I think I have maybe one game with Ilban in entire X and Immortality expansion altogether. I just don't like uh, that kind of play where you basically... Why I don't like it is because you kind of like... Uh, you're mostly reliant on the fact that your opponents are going are going to go uh, for the same strategy and you're the only one that's doing something different. Because that's the most... Uh, how you're winning uh, during most of the times. So you do something different than everybody else. If everybody goes conflict, you go influence, you win. If everybody goes influence and conflict, you go spice must flow and win. So if, but the thing is, if two people go spice must flow, then already there's so much points on the board, influence, combat, full, 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 your game starts to crumble. That's why I say I like to prioritize dunes because I don't usually play around big reveals, People sometimes even trash dunes, etc. Also, influence, because we are still talking about a cause. Uh, you're not going to be visiting these these uh, places all the time. So, ideally, the cards you want to dig for in the Imperium deck are the ones that are going to give you some kind of bumps on reveal. There are really a lot of them. I mean... Uh, in the shadow, uh, there's the one that goes on the emperor, but also gives you Ben Jesuit bump. Uh, True politics. Yeah, 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 I don't, I don't know, I don't know them all by name, but okay. yes. Yep. And you also want to dig for cards that give you ac faction accesses. Not, not um, like it doesn't need to be any crazy card, but if it gives you faction access, it's good. Because that's the part you're going to be focusing the most once you hit your Swordmaster. So in that point, at that point, you will always put at least one of your agents there, if not more. Because in the last two rounds, you don't really care about trashing. For example, round six and seven. But at that point, you should have already trashed like four cards or five from your uh, effect alone. And then if you, for example, went two times on the on the selective breeding or you came over here on the telexo track or any number of things that resulted in any additional trashes you should be, you have really low uh, card count and those cards should like uh, you you need to make sure those cards uh, all have like uh, uh, are doing something i'd say because so they're gonna give you big reveals they're gonna make you go on the influences where you need to go if you if you can combo him, combo them very well, which I think needs only like exp player needs a little bit of experience to know which cards combo well with each other, but if you can make them combo, then it's even better. And then you just make two big swings, you catch up on the points, and that's basically that. What so, what yeah. is and, the what is the weakest like card on the row that you would play cast and feel comfortable? Like the weakest like, card. Like let's say let's say a three cost card, right? What's the weakest card that you can acquire that you feel comfortable playing with because? Like let's say if you were to grab like this card, this is like the bare minimum of what you need to play okay. a ECAS so, game to feel comfortable. Basically all the Bene Gesserits, like the sisters of whatever, Truth Sayer, uh Bene Gesserit sister, uh the one which only draws one card, uh, this one, which is one of my favorite cards, Test of Humanity. There's so much things you can do with Test of Humanity alone. Yeah, this one, they're all three cost, so they're all basically made for Ekaz. Yeah, 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 all of those. Uh, Crucier as well. Uh, so these are, there's a select, yeah, select, G manipulation on select building, yes. Uh, so yes. These all combo very well with with like uh, with each other, and then they all two persuasion reveals apart from initiate and uh, truth air, which is not a two, but it gives you dagger and it has I think the best out of all of them faction accesses. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, so they all give you very good. Uh, they can all like they're all the most flexible cards that cards that you can get, the Bene Gesserit cards. 
yeah, this one as well. Ooh, what I like this card very much when I saw it in the Immortality when they announced the expansion. This is such a good card. This is such a good card because Benadrezerit is like also like with Emperor. These are the two like the two faction bumps like uh, that you need the most because not much not many people are visiting those spaces. But yeah, all of these cards are very good. Very high persuasion allows you to trash. Many people don't trash the uh, convincings. Yeah. Also, that is the thing I wanted to talk about. What you should trash. I think Ekaz was nerfed a little bit in the newest expansion in regards of what you want to trash because dunes have turned into the experimentations and you don't want to trash experimentation, but you want to trash dune because it's it yes. was a blank card, even worse than reconnaissance. So now the order of trashing is you always prioritize so how you do it. I immediately trash one dagger, the first thing I can see. So if you can do mentat dagger somewhere else on the board, you're going to be trashing that dagger in the first round. But you never trash the second dagger, not before you buy the Swordmaster. Yes. Because, because you're always going to... Like, it happened to me so many times, you just keep missing that green card that you need for your Swordmaster turn. And to miss a green card on your Swordmaster turn can mean you now don't get it not on your turn, not on the next turn, because somebody else is going to buy it. So now we are going to need three turns in order to get a Swordmaster instead of your initial turn where you should have gotten it. So the so next one should be Reconnaissance, Convincings. At, at that point, you can already trash also the Signet Ring. If you get this guy or any broken card for bugs in the initial deck, you can trash the dunes. At that point, you don't really need... I mean, not both, because you still need the the specimens for this effect, but you can trash one. Same goes for influence. If you have very good influence uh, cards that give you very good access with effects, you don't really need the diplomacy. But your four initial trashes are going to look like this, basically. 99% of the games. Because this card doesn't do anything. This is like the blank card. You don't need two persuasion. You can always get Fremen for free with your ring. Fremen is better version of convincing any day. So you always want to like just get rid of them. They're not doing anything. If they fill you your hand, that just means two blank spots that cannot combo with any other card that exists. Okay. But yeah, the weakest card is, to just answer your question are basically Bene Gesserits, I think, because they're pl- pretty... They appear in every second game. There are multiple copies of of uh, of Trutzer and Sister. Okay, yeah, yeah. okay here. so just, just wrecking your brain and a bit off tangent also, but let's say if you're first round, first round, if you don't draw Faction Access, what are you planning to do? Mm-hmm. So, and, assuming on like position 3. Yeah, so... Keep in mind, it all depends, of course, on what other people do. Okay. But assuming that first two turns most likely are going to be one of those two turns are going to be the smuggling. So not even go- so. If smuggling is left, of course smuggling. But if not, I would go for. Uh, so you go either for Arakin, or you go for the Death Negotiator, depending on your hand, of course. Because it's different if you have like two convincings, one dagger, reconnaissance, and ring. Okay. Or if you don't have dagger and you have dune or whatever. So basically, if you don't have the the action the accesses, you wanna have a really powerful buying hand and you wanna focus on that. You wanna try to use your ring if there is any good cards to grab them and you can even do it first and then if you have dune i mean experimentation you want to play it if there's any like uh, uh also the entire situation doesn't necessarily need to be that bad because if there's leto or moritan in the game you know they want to go for imperial basin you can easily block imperial basin now because uh, it's not very good for you, but you're making their life worse. So, like, it's good, and you used your experimentation. So, 
that is a possibility if there's Leto or Moritan in the game. If not, as I said, I would go for a, as big of a reveal hand as I can. Because those cards that you buy in the first two rounds are the best card, are the cards that you're gonna like uh, draw the most amount of times. Also, what is a good space is Arakin. Because Arakin, when you draw that one card from the discard, or I mean uh, your deck, that guarantees that the card that you get with your ring and the card that you buy with your reveal on turn one, not just Echoes, but any leader, that card is gonna get mixed up and gonna be in your uh it's gonna be guaranteed in your turned round because it's gonna be five cards that you have and that one extra card over here okay yes well even better what like that is like even what even better you when playing ekas are increasing your chances of drawing that exact card round two or any of those two cards that you put in your deck because now you have Four cards because you trashed one, plus two extra that you have acquired, so you have a high chance of drawing a really powerful card round two. Even better if you manage to trash sick allies as well in the round, so you go full, rot full rotation, sick allies, wealth, dagger, mantat, and does matter, dune, imperial basin. Now you have, like, what? Uh, Two in a five are good cards, and three are your two out of five are the powerful cards that you acquired, and three are just your starter. So you're even more increasing the chance of drawing those cards round two. And the more you can repeat those cards, very even like as I said, even the smallest like uh, like bump on the interstellar shipping. If it stacks up to be four bumps and five bumps uh, through the course of the game, can mean very much to Ikaz. I like people. <laughs> I think even you, which is about you, underestimate Fighter Fred. Trust me. I have discussed this with Matthias. It's a very good card. Very <laughs> very nice. Card. One of the cooler combos that you can also do with Ikaz for fun, but it can also turn out to be a very powerful combo. So if a row, let's say, is just. I don't know how many times it happened, but I think for me at least a lot. The entire row is just filled with uh, what are they called? I think uh, Sardukar uh, infantry, yeah. like one cost uh, two dagger dudes. Yes. These guys, no one wants them ever. Like they are here in most of the games to just block the row and make it worse. Yeah, this card for you is very good. The, when I see this card. I take it, I don't think about it twice with a cuz. It gives you five five Solari on reveal with a cuz. It gives you your basically your sword master on reveal. But the, that was not the point I wanted to make. The point that I wanted to make is with a cuz, if you ever see the uh, one cost technology for swords, uh, artillery, artillery something. Yes. It's called, yeah. You can. Prioritize buying these cards, like Sardukar Infantry, just like one or two, doesn't really need to be much more. Like even the sister, if you are lucky, you can buy the some of the higher costed ones as well. Yep. And then you can just cycle around in the first, like, like until round four or five, where everybody is still weak, where when even the beast cannot amass that much, uh, like... Uh, troops in the garrison and all the influence leaders are still fighting over shipping and just preparing for later stages of the game you can pretty much secure all the conflicts in all the first uh, three conflicts with these cards the thing is when i play the game i think this is the best advice i can give in general when i play the game like, I divide the points on the map into contested points and uncontested points. So all the influences over here that are on 2 and this on Bennett Ilex are uncontested points. Those points are guaranteed for you. Also, Spice must flow to, ex to a certain extent. Nobody can intervene or prevent you from taking those points or take those points away from you. They are, every other point on the map is contested point. So Conflict is contested by default because we're fighting over it. Alliances are contested because we can take over them. 
the the tech, the points on technologies are contested because who gets to it first gets it. Intrigues are uncontested, uncontested points, and th that is the reason why I hate intrigues because sometimes it can just decide the the whole game. But uh, yeah, so when I see a point that is easily accessible because it's much easier to buy a technology than win an entire conflict. I always try to prioritize getting that point because that's like, like there's a there's a big difference between winning a uh, imperial bus in conflict and buying like spy satellites or I don't know memo corridor or flagship flagship or spy satellites are better uh, uh, better example because they give point basically immediately. So I like I try. And I think that is the what di what uh, differentiates like player who is going to like win more games and who is playing for fun basically because if you just orient yourself around playing basically looking at the game at from from perspective of just you collecting points everywhere so you see spice satellites uh, spice satellites is three points three. Is, uh, uh, three uh, spies. So you try to collect three spies. You have already collected basically five points. It guarantees you four points on the influences, and it get if you trash it, you can get one extra point. I say five because yes, basically yes. what you can do, you can push one alliance very easily. And yes. I mean, who doesn't push one alliance? And like basically yes. that's it. That's that's what I think. I've talked with this about Matia as well. He has. A very similar perspective on it. I don't know if you do, but I think that's how like most of the like better players think about the game. Basically, you collecting points. So you see a contested point, you want to take it. That's yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I actually posted a guide about it. It's like uh, I think the the game is about you know there are five easy points and then there are like five hard points that you kind of have to work towards. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. Every game you get to like, I mean, five, six, seven, and then you start think, thinking about the rest. How are you going to get this now? I think previously you mentioned something about uh, not lighting by Spice Must Flows. Uh, mm -hmm. But in the course of your EKS games, how many Spice Must Flows do you end up buying in general? Okay. Like on average, on average. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I'll, I would say one on average. One on but average. Yeah, because but that is because with Ekaz, you either buy zero of them or you buy like three or four of them. Like because it depends on how you stru structure your deck. If my okay. deck is structured around influence and stuff. Yes, yes, yeah, and understand, understand. So this yeah, is, yeah. it depends like what your deck is built for, but most of the time your deck is not built for it. I guess. Right? Yeah, most, most of the time not. Most but of the like time you're trying to pressure like alliances and combats. Yes, because I, in my what from my experience, early combats are the best way for you to earn like at least half of your sword master. I completely agree with you that sword master should be one of the like top priorities for a Kaz. For me, that is the second top priority. First being keeping your deck low, and then this would be the second priority to get resources for sword master. And not only Solari sh should be like considered a resource for a Storm Master. Every spice you get can also later be transferred into Solari, which can be transferred into Storm Master. So, like picking those conflicts here and there, especially you need to like uh, analyze the board state at all, at all times. So, for example, if there's Tessia with four troops in your, in her garrison, but you can see or already predict that she's gonna have like shipping turn this turn so one of her two agents is gonna go to a place that doesn't have a sword like uh, a sword on it yeah like you can already way. guarantee her out of the combat you know and that already means you have a free turn, turn spot so if you can if somebody else also does something similar you have guaranteed second spot and you need to take them like you need to you need to basically act like uh and important thing is you don't need to overcommit. Like you don't need I wouldn't even encourage it. 
because if you spend all of your troops that early for one point that one point doesn't mean anything and that's also why i don't like buying spice mass flows early with any leader as well if you that one spice mass flow that you buy around three because you got a lucky hand or whatever will later on basically probably kill two other spice mass flows because it's gonna take away of the influence when you draw it again and it makes all of your hands much much worse so yeah. that there's time and place. I, 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 I agree. I agree with this. I I put early early game objectives for all leaders to be uh, threefold. First will be sword master. Next will be industrial shipping, and the third will be deck building. And uh, yeah. if if you can't do any of these three, you better collect some resources on board. <laughs> and <laughs> in resources on board, I think it goes down to like uh, in what I view should be spice intrigues and points. When and points is my last thing that I, I put there. But uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. The the thing is just that what is for me fascinating. You can look at the leaders, okay, and like let's say what does Tessia have that that because uh, let's say Tessia is the highest win rate leader, okay. Compare Tessia to any other leader. Like how big of an impact does Tessia's ability have on the game compared to any other leader? So Tessia basically has and Baron as well, probably, and any other influence leader, they have basically one point advantage over any other leader, right? Because Tessia, over the course of the game, will get two bumps, which are one point, basically. Baron gets them turn one, probably. <laughs> yep. <laughs> with with uh, Hardy Warriors. And uh, so they only have one point above you. And they have their rings, okay, stuff like that. But most of the games I won with Tessia, and Matya can confirm this, he, he I think, mains Tessia. He has, like, 30 games with Tessia, I think. He and Gavi, he, I think he and Gavix are playing, like, Tessia every second game on average. Uh, so, basically, they in on average, they don't have any cards from Imperium Row in their decks. Like, they have maybe one average or below average card, and they're managing to have... 14 points while, while everybody rest everybody else is on nine points so how they do it does it mean that like that early pressure that Tessia or Baron can like uh, acquire or create really snowballs so well all all up to the late game or what is going on in my opinion it's not it snowballs of course. But the reason why they are able to do it so nicely is because in the early game, they don't need to really prioritize anything else apart from shipping, okay? And shipping is probably the best strategy because with, when you play Tess or Baron, you don't like need to play around anything else. Okay, Baron needs to deploy four troops at, at one point in the game and have some cash. With Tessia, you don't need to do anything. You need to like draw your axes and play axes. You basically need to think, when I draw Diplomacy, I need to play Diplomacy. Every round I draw Diplomacy, I need to play it. If I don't play it, I'm losing too much tempo. But when you play a, a Kaz or when you play Yuna or you play, I don't know, Beast or whatever, you need to think about more things. But the thing is, if you can manage those things, game basically returns to its roots. It's played very similarly to any other leader. If you can just manage that, like extra, extra like uh, stuff you need to handle, because leaders are obviously not all perfect, and some are stronger than the rest. So yeah, okay. in my case, I have talked about strategies of how I overcome those flaws. Yeah. So 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 I think we talked a lot about Ikes and we talked talked about now Tessia. But I think you mentioned <laughs> um yeah, your friend Matija, right? So Matija is currently I think uh top he yeah, currently he's top on the leaderboard. And based on his win rate, uh, his win rate is really very high. But I think amongst all the players you probably have the highest win rate against him. What what do you think is the what do you think is the best way to defeat him? <laughs> I don't know how okay first of all I, I'm gonna correct you a little bit his name is Mattia Mattia can... yeah yeah, yeah. Mattia. perfect yeah, yeah, yeah. but uh, apart from that 
uh, I don't know how happy he will be if I give out the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> the rest. But the thing is, okay, I think I think we have actually the data for that. So uh, at one point we were playing a lot not uh, intentionally and then at one point we were playing a lot together intentionally. So in those in those few games I think most of the times I beat him I was actually playing a cards. And it it basically comes up to that that is the whole, like that is the whole thing. You need to just know what your uh, opponent is kind of like playing to do, you know. And uh, because he's mostly playing Tessia, okay. I mean, I, I hate that I need to repeat that every time, <laughs> but he is. Uh, if you can, Tessia in general doesn't snowball so well. She's just consistent. She's she doesn't have most of the time big swings. She can make them. She can combo in like tripping and then final bump over here to get extra two troops to make big conflict, yada, yada, yada. So sometimes she can do that. But it's more about con with her with consistency. So she's basically scoring every round. She's going to get either point here, either point here, or here. She's constantly going to be on top of the on top of the same as Baron, the like uh, leaderboard of the like points in the game. With the Kaz, you're much more gonna be like in lower positions at first, and then you're gonna make two big swings and just end the game. Playing against Matia, very tough opponent, uh, constantly need to think that he has daggers because because he's gonna have daggers when he needs them in the hand. Constantly need to think further because he's never going for the the th like that's the thing I, what I like about his gameplay. He's never gonna be going for the point that you think he's going. So, for example, he's gonna be sitting on two points on Emperor, okay, and he's gonna be sitting on one point, let's say, on Bene Gesserit. And there's gonna be one person that he has Emperor Alliance or or is about to have Emperor Alliance. Matia is gonna go for that alliance and he's gonna lock it. He's not even like that person is not even gonna realize it. Like that's that sort of things. Like he's always going to go for the points that are uh, not very expected. And I think even we talked about this most recently in his couple of games, the latest games, he had like I think they like a uh, majority of them ended in six rounds actually. Because he was like so dominant on the influence track with Tessia and uh, just managed to wrap, him, wrap, things up, wrap things up in uh, round 6. And then he, if he manages to have like 3 alliances round 6, he doesn't really care if anybody is going to be able to steal them all in round 7 because he's going to end game. So yeah, in my opinion, when playing against Matija, just always try to think about... Don't try to think about like the most obvious point that he's going to take but he is, because he's not probably not going to take that immediately he's going to he's probably preparing something else and uh, of course our that like uh, the little thing that we like uh, talk about really much with that third position is that we actually think third position is very very powerful just not many people realize it like i don't think enough people I cannot stress that enough, realize what it means to play first on the third conflict. Because if it's not Grand Vision, it's gonna reward you with two points, basically. Almost certainly. And then uh, you just need to focus on that, like prepare for that. Like, that's that's the job. I, I think the third place is very strong. So, I don't, I don't so care how, to... how do you prepare for it? Uh, okay, if I play a Kaz, I'm either gonna have a very powerful hand on that turn because I, I'm gonna even have that same hand probably on round six, but round seven probably just repeating that same hand with daggers, uh, many troops, mm, I don't know, many good cards that combo with each other as well. Like, it, like it, is, the fo is, is the focus on a highliner or is the focus just on? having enough resources like in terms so, of cards in terms of like spice in terms of troops in garrison 
Yeah, yeah. So it echoes. It's flexible because it depends. If you build okay. the deck, it's deck. If you didn't build the deck as much, then of course Highliner. But for example, with Beast, Beast, t- any other influence leader, I think you just prepare for the, just prepare Highliner. Also, for example, Moritani. Moritani is very good at third place because Moritani can uh, set up very easily so that he's standing over here. Yeah. Around over here on the shipping. And then if you go interstellar and you combo it with these troops from over here as well, it is such a big swing turn that like 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 the conflict is almost guaranteed. Also with Tessia you can trigger the last ring the last key from the Emperor Alliance. But uh, yeah, I think you should like if you if you notice that your cards are not as good, you should always prepare to have six uh, spies round uh, round seven. And I don't even think it's that hard to manage it because up until round six, the uh, the Great Flat and the Haga Basin will have two full rotations almost certainly. Of like because they're like uh, most of the times people pick them when there's two spies on them, correct? Like yes. people don't pick them when there's zero. When there's one, it's sometimes okay for Hagabas in for Imperial for Great Flat. I almost never see it. When there's two spies on it, Hagabas in Great Flat, they're almost immediately picked. Yes. When there's three spies, it's even sweeter. Yeah. So basically it goes no one, no one, they collect, no one, no one, they collect. So up until round six, there's two rotations. You have on round six, you can very easily like position yourself to be that round where you take that X amount of spice that you need for uh, the highliner. The only hard part, make sure that you have access on that round. Yes. So, <laughs> I mean, with Ekas, you can guarantee it. That's why I recommend Ekas. <laughs> Okay. But but if not, then yeah, it can it can. I mean, it can mess up your game if you cannot realize if you can if you cannot manage that, or if grand cons- if the grand vision comes out, which is a two bump conflict, then it is what it is. But most of the times, if you can manage what I said, you should be rewarded with two extra points in the seventh round of the game as a third place what is your what do you think cheese is the weakest uh, position on the board the weakest position on the board yeah i yeah, think like, i think most top players hate playing from position one um i i, I do not know what they think this way but i think when you're playing in position one you lose control of a lot of things you lose control of any of the Okay, most of the time you can you cannot go into cellar, you cannot smuggle smuggle. Um when you try to deck build, you can't deck build because someone early reveals or someone nukes it, you know. There are a lot of things that can go wrong from first position. The I mean the the only advantage you have is like you you, you kinda get to buy first. Mm-hmm. But the Tarixu, like let's say on the Tarixu road, the the, the 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 premium cards are all three cubes, so you can't buy anything round one then on the imperium row so there are many ways where you can lose control of those cards as well so i think actually first position probably feels the worst to play um and i think this is the experience that most good players have do you agree uh yeah for me by far first position is i think by by far the weakest especially on that round one because in that turn one because whatever you do that round it uh, mostly feels like you're doing it in order to block somebody else and not for the benefit of your own game because Mm -hmm. if you go full space turn one you're doing it only so that second place cannot go full space twice and if you go smuggling turn one, you're only doing it again so that second place doesn't do that yeah. twice in a row as well. 
Yeah, that's then, why. Then you, you yeah. lose. You don't even have control over the combat. Like you, like if you put in one, like people just put in two. If you put in two, you are overpaying most of the time. If you put in three, you're never gonna get first place as well. It, it's it's just yeah, ter- if terrible. You're not playing, if you're not planning to go on Hardy Warriors, you're not gonna get that conflict. Yeah, and if you go Hardy and Warriors, you might not even get a conflict as well. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. You still need to extra commit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's very it's very like I have I have seen an increasing amount of players play uh, Helena on first position because Helena is always like or Helena or like some leader that doesn't even care about smuggling or force yes. base. So they can play something totally like their own game. Yeah, I don't know for if you I don't know if you watched my stats video. Actually my stats video I did talk about it that Helena performs best at first position. And I think that Helena is still functionable because Okay, the the reason why I think Helena does so badly is that when there are good cards on the row, people pick Helena in, 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 in like third or fourth. But I don't think she does well in third or fourth. She, but if you're in first position and if you can't, so I talk about early game priorities, right? So if you can't get Sword Master, if you can't get into Cell Shipping Access, you want a deck build, and I think it, it, it is fine in first position to deck build as Helena. So <laughs> that's just some of my thoughts about it, and the and the stats do back it up. <laughs> yeah, I think the Drezo is the one that's responsible for that the most. Yeah, Drezo and felt that, <laughs> right? yeah, <laughs> but. Uh... The thing is, I mean, Helena and the cars. When we when I started playing, we thought that uh, I mean, when we like uh, made our first like uh, ranking of the leaders, it was in X. And in my, in our opinion, Helena, Baron, and Leto were top three leaders in X. We were like Tessa is not even like close to them. I mean, we we rated her like if there were S tier, she was like A or B tier. But with Moritano Handri, probably. And it's so interesting to me how the... Right now, for me, Helena is probably, like, in a D tier. Yes. Because, because she is based, like... The only, the only, like, game where I would pick Helena, because she's not either fun for me to play or interesting, but if I want to play her, I would play her in first position. I see Master in the row. And then I do a coin flip with my deck <laughs> to see if I'm gonna draw a <laughs> ring and enough persuasion to buy. It. <laughs> yeah, I think most of the time if you have your ring, you generally have enough. Like there, are like maybe like one uh, yeah, or two, one or two cases where like you you can't like if you, you have like seek allies, dagger, dagger, yeah. ring something. But most of the time you're able to. The the the, the I think if you. you if anyone who just started playing in Immortality and we don't see why Helena is so powerful, just play a game of base X or base base game of base plus X, right? And see yeah. see how having a Helena in the game, right, really diminishes the card quality of everyone else at the table. The 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 reason that I think she loses out the most is that she loses control over managing card quality for the rest of the table. Um Last time she would just pick out all the good cards and, and then everyone else is left to fight over mediocre cards. But now with Atomics, like there's no control over it, over it anymore. Um, you, you might pick out the first good card, but then new, five new cards come out and then whatever advantage you have is, is lost. So I think that's how she has lost the most of her advantage. Yes, but also like the general quality of card increase. So you don't, you're not like uh, now the only one that is that gets to have the premium cards in their deck. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter that you have, like, it's more like, it doesn't really matter if you have one good card, if you have big deck, it more, it more is like, uh, depends on how many times I think can you draw that specific card that you want. And that's yeah. why I think Ilban has like skyrocketed in the immortality because, because he can just, n- nobody, I mean, he can just abuse some certain cards and have such a good reveal turn every round like on average you have like three or four no not four i think three three i think is average reveal turn one right mm, yes i mean round three, one yeah, three. yeah 
three, and then Ilban can easily like be on a five average or something yeah. like yes. that. Yes, and that is that is like a difference between Ben Jesuit sister and Talaxu master or Stilgar, for example. Let's yeah. not put the best five. Like Stilgar, Stilgar is a <laughs> you can draw Stilgar <laughs> every <laughs> round for the rest of the game. That's like already like huge tempo whereas somebody is, is drawing like reconnaissance <laughs> or Arrakis liaison okay anyway we've been talking for quite a while now um maybe i'll have do you do you have any questions for me uh well the thing is so um, i was thinking about playing like I tried for a time also Ilesa a lot, and I liked her a lot. I don't know why the the guys who made the game, I, I read somewhere, they said she was the best leader in testing or something like that. So they nerfed it with the Signet effect. But like, uh, like Ilesa for me is the like very, 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 very situational leader. Like there's, I need to see some cards specifically be in the Imperium row or in the Telaxo row up there for me to take her. Uh, but she was not the one I wanted to ask about. I played her quite a bit. The one I wanted to ask you about is Ariana, because I saw you played Ariana a lot. But uh, I was thinking about trying to make some like good ways of playing Ariana. But in my opinion, she's the by far only leader. So she's the only leader which effect like uh, like leader effect not ring effect is negative <laughs> like any other leader i think have a positive trade or outcome or something with their general effect with ring effect it's different story lesa for me has by far the worst ring out of them all like it's the it's not even close but uh ariana she has a very strong ring. It's just that her effect is for me negative. I don't want to pay spice for card. I don't want to do it every time. Or like I don't like if they made it so that I can even like choose if I want to do it or not or something like that. It, it would be better this way. Yeah, I just like like my best at Ariana gameplay was when I had uh, Liad Kynes. And I like she was the one that man with whom I managed to buy three spice mask flows. I had that game, I buy I bought it with her. But the thing is that's like one in a hundred games that you're gonna be able to do that. So I wanted your thoughts about uh, because I saw you played her quite a bit. So like did you find any plausible strategies to make her work or like what to focus on? I I can tell you that I, I try. So uh, there are a lot of people who ask specifically about her. I, I don't know why there are some leaders that people could gravitate to, and she's one of them. And it's a, it's a bit sad because she's... I mean, we have the win rates for her, and her win rate is really very low. Um, the, the games that I did do well, I think there are either one of two things happened. So the most easiest way is that you, you deck build. But I don't think that's something that is unique to her. Right? It's not something that she does exceptionally well. It's just that in, in the games where I do well, I'm maybe I'm deck building and I'm, I'm just... And I, with my natural skill, I, I just end up winning. Or the other way is that you have somewhat a control over, over combat by just having... Going to Hardy Wars a bunch of times and having some good wins. Um, and not putting in like four troops all the time, but just like three troops. Cause I think immortality when you have um somewhere up, cause 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 the first conflict is so so weighted heavily, right? After the the first conflict, at least in immortality, a lot of times everyone has no garrison left. Everyone has like one troop left, like two players have one troop left, one person has two troops left, kind of thing. But and I think. Arena at, at a spot, right? You are just able to like Hardy Warriors put in three troops, Hardy Warriors put in three troops and, and kind of like get quite a lot of benefit from that. These are these are, are the two 
small advantages that I think she can get. Like, sure, you can try to early research station, but I don't think that's great as well. Um, but yeah, so 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 deck building and and hopefully some lucky hardy warriors <laughs> trips. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I yeah. So I, I did, I did try, and I, I can tell you that my own experience of it is, it's not very good. Like the the games where I win with her, I, I could have played any other leader and, and have won with her. Um, yeah, with those yeah. with those cards and intrigues, if it played like that, if it you if it were for any other leader, you might have had even more points. Yes, yes. So I don't yeah, I think that there is a very viable way to play her. And I have, I guess I have clocked relatively high number of games on her, but I, I, I do, I, I do it for content. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. I mean, the thing is, like, mm. for example, I don't like Memnon at all, even less than Mariana, because he's boring. Like, Ring is take one token, and then the his main abilities. I don't even want to talk about it. But like Ariana's Ring is also like take one water. It, it's like there's much more things that you can do with extra water than with extra spice and then her effect is like it does something and like like my initial thought when I think about her is can I abuse her like main effect it's just that as you said like yes you can deck build but does it pay off or does it not pay off uh yeah. and relatively you, no i don't think it pays off yeah and does it pay off especially in comparison to other like relatively good no uh, it, it, it doesn't yeah uh, uh, also what were your what were your thoughts on the like i wanted your personal opinion as well on the expansion on the newest one the, uh, the right. standalone yes yes so i think with immortality right i think um, you start to sense that a lot of things are like layered on, right? There are a lot of additional layers on it that are all in some sense good, but when you have too much of it, there is some bloat to it as well. Um, you know, I've played so many games of Immortality, and I can tell you that I always forget to buy uh, Toilexu cards if I'm not adding cubes that round. And... <laughs> And I mean, I've played over like 100 games, you know, and, and it's still an issue for me. I can imagine how painful it is for new players like when, when they have to do this. So with a simplification of, of, of the game, I'm actually very happy. Like, there are a lot of things that I think when you redo, right, you can fix a lot of the, the things or you can change a lot of things that you have seen that were problematic, that were not great for the game and uh put it yeah and kind of like fix it like so so in in that sense i'm i'm, I'm very happy because like when, when i thought of how the game should change i thought that they should remove stuff and uh -huh. in in essence what uprising is 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 they are kind of removing stuff if you just play uprising by itself and i think that's probably how how we'll end up playing it yeah um, that's what that's what that's yeah. my next question like yeah. do you think it gonna be everything mishmash or just something I, I, I can tell you from the the at least the rank point of view or at least the tournaments that i will host it will just be in uprising i don't think there's a need to mix it at least for the the next four or five months then after that we'll we'll see how um i think if pe if people start to play with like a mixture and people like it then then the, everything will move that way but I think that it will just be uprising for a good solid like four or five months. Then the so so with regards to like the other things about uprising, so the the second design diaries just came out. So the second design diaries talk about combats. So uh -huh. my thoughts about combats, right, is that uh I think combats in in uh currently in immortality, right? Um in a casual group, everyone likes to play combat strategies. So you have games lasting very, very long. What we see in, I think in the TDS meta is that um, you, you pick and choose your combats. You choose this one combat 
and you invest into it, right? It is like for tier one, and when tier two, you just kind of show hand, and like everyone kind of just show hand because the game most most likely will end around seven, right? Unless you don't have an opportunity to do so, um, so, so because everyone is like kind of kind of picking and choosing, right? The there there are some players who like to go combat strategies, but they also haven't seen much success, so. This is because when they have a like when they, they divert a lot of their deck to like combat, like they're still fighting against other players who take turns to put in all their troops, right? So like the combat player will win one or one or two of them, but he cannot win all of them. So so in some sense the the other players who just invest into that one combat kind of get um the, their their appropriate reward. So Okay, I'm being very long winded about this. So in in so with how the combat is gonna change, so combat is going to be um I think a lot I I have a feeling that com like uh in Uprising the game will be a lot more combat focused. And I think this is intentionally by design, um that they want players to just butt heads at in, at combat. And the reasoning is that there are not many good draw, draw spaces on the board. The only good draw space you have on the board now is Research Station that gives you two cards and two troops. And if you think about it, two cards and two troops actually is not, not a lot. To, to kind of get um, a Spice Muscle strategy kind of working, you kind of need to draw two. And your draw two needs to be pretty good. Like when you when you go Selective Breeding and you draw two, right, you're doing a lot of things. You're, you're trimming your deck. Then you are drawing two and you're getting half a point because you're going to Ben Jester as well. But when you're going just to research station to draw two and get two troops, it's a bit anti-synergistic. So because of that, I think that the game will last longer because there are no like people can't be oh, can't people points, can't, yeah. can't be line for the three points. Right? And then then if the combats are getting heavier, I think that the combat intrigues are weaker and the and the swords on cards will matter more. So people are buying swords on cards and people are not buying persuasion. So there might be a quite a drastic swing in how like decks are built and how like people play and how people view view combats. And so if combats are important, then sword master should be important, right? Sword master should be important, uh and in terms of like the, the places where you can deploy a lot of troops on is I think um I mean it's still highliner and probably the deep I think it's called a deep desert or something it's, like that. The new green space, right? Not the a green space, the, 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 the new yellow space that lets you put two worms in. But I think the oh. the space on the board that will actually shape the game actually will be Haga Basin. Haga Basin will shape the game because you're able to spend one water and put a worm in there, and um, which is Chi Sheng, right? Which is almost Hardy Warriors, and you double your combat rewards. So I think that actually kind of warps, like, it's, it's kind of like the focus to a lot of the board. Um, and I'm not really sure how excited I am I to play a combat focused Dune. But I, I mean, we have to try it. But do you generally think that the, for example, cards, okay? Yep. Do you think the new cards will be like the effects on the cards? Yeah, okay, because we're getting the new leaders. Those effects will be stronger or weaker, or maybe not weak, or stronger, weaker, or like crazier or like less crazier than the ones that we have, because in like in like as cards are like getting uh, published with yep. each new ex expansion the cards are getting in my opinion like they they're having like crazier effect yeah so like, so so i i i expect that trend to continue but if you have seen the cards right the cards are situational crazy so so let's say i think there are a few cards oh, that yeah, are reviewed yeah. right yeah. So one requires like the Bene Gesserit Alliance. Then after that, you get a certain benefit. Maybe you get, I think you get like two spies and you get to like trash and you get this like cycle and entry, right? So yeah. um, a cheap card, situationally very strong. Then after that, you have another card that is like spacing where you can discard a card 
and if you discard a spacing card, you draw two cards, right? So, so, so I, I, I see where it is going. So I suspect that there will be situationally crazy cards, right? And hopefully, it will reward players from being able to identify and to maneuver into those situations. Yeah, the the problem is, I mean, in my opinion, is uh, like I don't like the card. For example, okay, that that I mean, I saw the cards. I I hope that most of the cards won't be as the ones they have shown because they don't like. I'm not really excited about uh, like uh, because in my head. If most of the cards are situational like that, it like sums up to like I'm gonna focus on one alliance now. It's gonna be my priority to lock it, and then then my entire deck is gonna be built upon that certain uh, like uh, mechanic which revolves around, for example, alliance of that uh, that uh, certain uh, faction, you know. And I don't feel like that uh, card, for example, that they have shown is enough of a reward for me holding the Banner Gesserit Alliance. Yeah. Like, like it's not uh, motivating me that firm grip, not firm grip. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, is, so, so, like what, huh? so, so, I will say that um, this is how I expect the meta to go. The meta yeah. would first, right, have everyone kind of pick a lane um, this is based on the first design diary that the, each of the own factions have their own benefit. So every everyone will kind of pick a lane and they'll get that kind of faction benefit and they'll play around it. But once players realize where the choke points are again, then people will fight over it again. So I mean, this will be very quick, I guess. Within within the first month, people will probably figure out. And, and from from everyone picking their lane, people will start fighting over lanes. Um, like similarly to how we fight over like interstellar shipping or smuggling. Um, yeah. yeah, but but I I mean it's a new game and I mean the learning process to it honestly is, is I think it's fun enough. Like I, I have a lot of fun like just learning and figuring out stuff. Yeah, and, yeah, def- I mean it's gonna be very, it's a new thing. It's gonna be interesting. But I yeah. wanted to ask you also: Did you figure out? I did not understand that even from like the videos I watched about it. The I didn't understand quite how will uh, the contracts work. So, like, so nothing has been published about the contracts, but what we know is that there are two spots on the board that grant, grant new contracts, right? So, uh-huh. so the contracts seem to be tied to, 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 to tiles on the board, or there are two tiles that are printed on the board. So from what we know or what we can see from the pictures, right, there's, you go to collect a contract, then you try to execute on a contract, or um, yeah. So 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 you 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 collect a contract. Then after that you um, you either like so the ones that we currently see is one that is blue or or purple as you describe it, and you draw two cards, right? So so you collect contract. Then when you go to a blue space, you draw extra two cards. Okay, and then there's another one which is I think like three solari, but you need to like harvest three spice on that turn. So if you harvest three spice on that turn, you can collect the extra oh, okay. three solari. So it's it's all delayed rewards. Yeah. Okay. And last thing I wanted to ask you about that, what will you miss the most in regards to the like this state of the game or, or these expansions in comparison to the like what certainly won't be there in the new expansion. For example, for me, I think the part of the game that I like that I liked very much when they introduced it, and I think I will miss in the new game, or I think it will be the first part that is going to be implemented in the new game because it's, for in my opinion, the easiest one to implement, are the technologies. Hmm. So, I very much <laughs> like the technology. So 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 the. I thought about this. So the part that I miss the most actually is Mentat. I know that there's some version of Mentat that's coming, but I think um, I, oh, I, I, I I dare say that. Um, so I started making videos last year in I think December. I think at that point of time, 
not many players value wealth. And I, I feel that me as a player went to wealth and went to Mentat a lot more than any other player at that point of time. Like, I don't know, like, uh, if you play me then, but you, you realize that I actually go to Mentat quite a, quite a fair bit. And I think that that being gone makes me a little bit sad um, because I feel that that is something that I personally have pushed in the meta. I, d- I don't know whether it's, it's, it's true or not, or maybe it's just a uh, ill one <laughs> spillover. But I think ever since my first video of... If, if you watch my first video on my channel, it's about me playing Ilban and going to Manhattan yeah, every yeah, yeah. every single game, every single round. And it's and when I, when I view that video now, I, I have a good laugh about it because GVX is in that game as well. Okay, I think we'll, we'll wrap up here. Hey, thanks for thanks for your time and thanks for spending time to speak to me. I, I hear you want to like do some content yourself. Yes, so I was... Uh thinking really hard about what I wanted to do and uh, yeah I will most certainly start in the next month or even less I will probably start with streaming and then I'll see if I can actually produce any quality videos but yeah I'm probably gonna start streaming Dune I'm gonna try to stream also like I don't know I think I I have s- I have many ideas in my head and I talk with Mattia as well. So we have some things in mind, like cool stuff we might do in the games or try, or also with like modded gameplay with the auctions and stuff to make some cool things. So yeah, uh, be ready. Okay. There's okay. Plenty yeah. You can, you can <laughs> drop me a link and I'll, I'll shout it out when, when time comes. Hey, thank you, thank you. Hey, thanks for your time. See you around. Yeah, it's been a pleasure talking with you, <laughs> Yeah, you too. See you.